Well, thank you for the invitation. My name's Raul Bowden, and I'm at the University of Florida, and I'm based at the Range, the Range Cattle Research and Education Center, and that's in Ona. Who knows where Ona is? Who's from Florida? <laughs> so Ona's a very, very small place, um, but the research center's been there since 1941. Um, I have a background in wildlife biology, especially ornithology. Some of you may know me, a few do, from my work with Florida scrub jays and actually habitat conservation planning in Highlands and Polk County. Um, but today I'm talking about something quite different, and that's recent work and a collection of work that's been done on feral hogs in Florida. So I'm going to start with a bit of terminology because I found that a lot of people don't know certain terms that I use and some people use the terms incorrectly. So a hog is any pig. A boar is obviously a male and a barrow or bar is a castrated male. And I won't be using that term in this talk. And um, a sow is a female that has reproduced and a gilt is one that has not, okay? A shoat is a weaned young hog. And a pig, we usually use the term pig for any pig, but that's really a hog in the industry. A pig is an unweaned hog, and a piglet is a really baby hog. And a lot of people have not heard this term, but it's used commonly in feral swine um, research, and it's the sounder. And that's a group of pigs, and we'll talk about that a little more. It's also commonly around here, some ranchers will use the word drift. I, I don't know that one myself. So a little bit of life histories. The sows are matriarchal, so the oldest female will lead and is often the head and actually most aggressive in that group and will have related females and young, younger females and males staying within that group. Okay, these sounders can be anywhere from one, two, three sows to actually 30, 40, and in places in Australia where I'm from, we've seen sounders as big as a couple of hundred. Now, whether they're all related when it gets to that size, we don't actually know. There's some really interesting things about sounders and the way pigs behave on the landscape. It's thought that they could actually be territorial, although this is not proven, meaning that they actually maintain home ranges and those boundaries are defended. Now, some of the, the support for that from work we've done is that if you look at this map those multi, multiple colors you see there are different radio collared feral swine. And you can see a lot of them don't overlap. The ones that do, we know that we're traveling together. So down here, this green and blue, you can see that those, the blue's behind the green. Those two female pigs were traveling together constantly. They almost have identical ranges. Over here in the right hand corner, right upper corner, is um, three different females, and their, their home ranges, or if you want to call them in this case territories, never overlap. This is quite unusual for this size mammal, for females in groups. Um, the other thing that supports this, can you see this here? On this tree? Anybody know what it is? It's a rub. Why do pigs rub? Because they're itchy? It's like keeping the mosquitoes? I don't think so. So um, pigs, pigs have an unbelievable number of glands in, underneath their skin. And so these are probably scent stations. And there, and there is hardly any work whatsoever on, on pigs in the wild and scent stations. But they're probably marking their boundaries and marking who's been here and who's good, who's dominant, and they get to know each other through scent. And pig smell is extremely good. I mean, it's a lot better than your dogs. You know. A little bit more. Boars compete, okay? They do actually compete. They have, when they're young, they stay out in their own sounders, that are male-only sounders, but as they mature, they start to tumble, rough it. They, can, they actually fight with each other. Um, if you've never seen a, pig, a feral pig up close, they have shields. Has anybody heard of a shield on a pig? So they have a cartilage and skin underneath their sides. It protects all their rib and their shoulders. And it's to stop these large teeth being punctured through their side. Now that shield can be up to an inch thick. 
And in the old days, it stopped bullets. That's how hard it is, and that's actually true. You can shoot them, people have shot pigs with 44 magnums and it doesn't go through that shield. They need a high-powered rifle if you're gonna shoot a pig that way. But they um, um, fight a lot, and they especially fight when the, when the um, sows are in heat. And as you can see in this bottom picture, here's a ta one of our tag males, but this is three males that are following one sow around, and they've been fighting. And this is the winner, of course, at this point. Um, just a little bit more biology, though. You know the term razorback that pigs are often called? This is where it comes from. Um, and this is these, females have it too, but boars do it a lot more, is that when they're actually threatened, they raise that spinal hair in a, in a, in a comb-like manner. And that's where the, where the name razorback comes from. Um, this guy here has a posture which says, I'm, I'm boss. I, I own this place, and you'll, um, this one not so much. His ears are actually down, it's actually old and wrinkled. He's in an aggressive position, but he's not feeling very comfortable about it. So why are pigs a problem? It's up there. Okay, well the first thing is they're non-native to Florida. They were brought here actually many hundreds of years ago they first came in the 1500s with the Spanish. Um, they have a very short gestation period, 114 days. And if you're in 4-H or the farmer group, they know this is three months, three weeks, and three days. So the triple three up there, you'll always remember this. I'll ask you at the end, one thing you can remember out of this whole talk. Okay, so they can breed all year round. That's resource dependent, and it could be temperature dependent, but we don't know that. Um, meaning that if it's really, really cold, they may not actually produce young. Um, the peak breeding, and you'll see some things in red here, is thought to be spring and fall in Florida, but is unquantified, okay? We don't know how often, but we suspect there might be two litters a year here. Some people will say they could actually have up to three. I don't, that's not feasible. Um, even though they have that gestation period, they do have to lactate, feed those pigs, get those pigs away before they'll cycle again, okay? Feral hogs in the wild have one to seven piglets per litter that survive past a few days, okay? Um, they're probably targeted by lots of predators. Um, very small piglets are a good size for many, many things to get at. Um, just out of interest, uh, do you know how many pig, piglets domestic pigs can have? So it's, off, it's, more, it's 12 to 14, so it's a lot more. Um, so there, are, there is some restrictions depending on resources here. So some other things, they grow rapidly, and this is probably the other really important part, is they are reproductively mature before they are a year old. So that means you could almost be a grandmother by one year of age, but not quite. So um, that's very fast turnaround for a mammal, and it means that they can replace their population rapidly if it's reduced. Um, so some, some take-home messages, just a little bit about the biology. Short gestation, we know that. They breed at a young age. We know they're reproductively mature at seven months, but do they actually breed then in the wild? That's not quantified, we don't know that. Um, how many young do they actually produce in the wild? It says one to seven, that's sort of a guess. We don't really know how often or how many. Um, and, ca and can th this cause those populations to increase rapidly? We all say yes, but we actually don't have good data to put into models about this at all. So that's part of the work I'm gonna show you as we move forward. These are some names people will call feral hogs. So feral swine, Russian boar. Piney woods rooter is a great one because it's Floridian or South Flor Florida term for a pig. Um, a razorback is a term that's Australian that, I, that I, I'm not sure where it came from here. And wild hog. So where are they? Everywhere? All right, maybe. What are they doing? They're breeding, we know that. They're eating, and we'll talk about, about other things. How many are there? Do we know that? 
We, we don't know these, these bits of information. And what do they actually cost? That's the big question. So we're going to go, where are they? Here's an important map. In 1982, bottom, le bottom left-hand corner in yellow. In 2004, hogs are moving north. Um, and in 2010, they've moved north even further. So this is the states they've actually been found in. Many of these movements were hunter-assisted. They do know that. There is also a large probability of large dispersal distances for feral pigs. We don't know how great that dispersal distance is in America. Uh, the only studies I know of are from Europe, and there they've had pigs that have moved up to 200 miles okay, on their natal dispersal. Um, and this is actually 2014 in a different, in different way. There's actually little populations all over the place that match these state colors, um, but this is the highest densities. This is another map that a collaborator produced, and this is the probability of where pigs will spread to. So the, the reddish color is absolute definite pigs. 100% right, probability of occurrence. The blue is very, very unlikely that pigs will remain or be there based on the resources. And it's based on landscape and, and temperature, uh, landscape and habitat and temperature regimes here, and water availability is another one. So there's a lot of things that go into this model. But you can see there's a very high density in, in California, Texas, Florida, and the southeast. If I go back, you can see that maps with this density, this map already. But they're going to spread further. And the, there's a question up here. What's climate change going to do to this map? If we get changes in rainfall across parts of the US, you'll actually have the distribution of pigs probably change too. But the work we've been doing is where are they in the local landscape? So what habitats are they truly focusing in? So you see them in pastures, you see them in woods, you see them in pine flatfoods, you see them in scrubs, you see evidence of them in wetland. But where do they spend most of their time? And we can do that by doing these studies with GPS collars. And um, this is the same map you saw before, just in a different format, just showing these are boundaries of pigs. But then we can change that into a whole lot of point marks and these purple points are where we've located a single pig every 30 minutes in its home range, the black boundary. And there's classification of habitats under there, either wetland or wetland reserve, pasture or hammocks. And if we do that on lots of pigs, in this case 20, we can actually then come up with some confidence of how often they're using particular habitats, and that's when that point falls within that habitat boundary. And that's what it looks like. And you read this graph by the gray being the available habitat on the landscape. The colored code goes back to the habitat that we're talking about. And you'll see here the one that's circled is that basically they're using wetland habitats three times as much as what they're av actually available in their home range. Does that make sense to everybody? So if it was random, it would only be the size of the gray bar. If they were just using it as it's available. So there's a lot more semi-native and improved pasture of availability in these areas, but they're choosing to spend a lot more time in wetlands. That makes sense? Most people would say that's where they see most evidence of pigs. So when you want to find a pig, where do you focus? In the wetlands. Um, you actually see this dotted line with a catch here. This is an error bar, so it's quite large. Not all pigs are the same. So there's 20 pigs in here. So some pigs like wetlands, some pigs don't use them as much as others. And that's true for all habitats. But what are they doing? What's this? Rooting, okay? I'm not gonna tell you what rooting means in Australia, all right? You can just, we'll just keep that to ourselves. But, and there's other words, and, and here it means cheering, doesn't it? I didn't learn that for a long, long time, and you can tell me, there was a very confused Australian around football games for a very, very long time in Australia. And, but they're actually an economic problem 
in terms of lawns, golf courses, agricultural crops. There are, there are recordings of pigs moving into certain fields like soybeans and corn and actually taking more than 200 acres in a night. I mean, actually just taking it down. And that's because there's very large monocultures, of course. And then there's environmental problems with actual coming into wetlands and other habitats. There's also things like competition with food resources for other animals. One of the ones that we're concerned with is the amount of acorn crop they can actually take. Wallowing. So they produce these large wallows. In Hawaii, some of these wallows, some of these um, um, broken stems and, and wood hollows that they chew on have been shown to increase the habitat for mosquitoes there, the non-native mosquitoes. So there's some downstream effects. And then heavy uses of landscape. Can you actually see that rooting there? So from the air, you'll get a very different perspective. Is anybody from Mayaka um, State Park here? Yeah? So I flew over Mayaka a couple of months ago, uh, and the, the actual wetlands in Mayaka on the west side of Mayaka were completely dirt, and it was all from pigs. I mean, it was hundreds of acres. And so the pig population in the Mayaka State Park in that area has been really, really high for quite a while. So they're using all these things, but they're also eating a lot of variety. And they don't eat one thing. They're omnivores. They're generalists. They will eat whatever seems to be available. So this is about some of the um, foods we've looked at. And this is a genetic study um, from their, from their um, digestive tracts. Actually, it's from their fecal material in California, Florida, and Texas, and they differ. Um, we could argue about what these things are, but I'm just displaying this to tell you they eat all sorts of things. Skinks, beetles, flies, salamanders, and this in quail, mushrooms, everybody, truffles. Um, but in terms of plants too, in California they were in, uh, in a lot of these oak hammocks, they're getting a lot of oaks. Here, when these um, samples were taken, there was probably not a lot of um, acorns on the ground, so there's not a lot of oaks in the Florida list. But one thing that'll come up a lot in pigs is they eat a lot of vegetative material, including grasses. People don't know, but they graze a lot. And um, they graze a lot, and they're actually taking a lot of um, carrot and parsley family plants out of wetlands, which makes sense. So the other thing they do is they bring disease into the landscape. It's a big concern for the livestock industry. Uh, for the pig industry, classical swine fever. For the cattle industry, if you ever had foot and mouth disease in Florida, you could say bye-bye to the whole cattle industry. Pigs would move it everywhere. Um, some of the other work we've done is we've actually looked at how pigs interact with cattle at feed stations. And in this case, you can actually see that there's a few, few other animals come into this molasses feed bin but in, in this case, 518 visits are by pigs, feral pigs, and 1,976 are by cows. So one-fifth of the visits to a feed station is by pigs. That's both an economic loss and a risk. They also do the same thing on food plots in Florida. So a lot of people plant wildlife food plots for wildlife, especially for deer. Um, but pigs enjoy the deer food as well. It's high-protein food, so they're coming in there. So they're interacting much more with wildlife when they do this too. And you can see in a food plot visitation study, feral pigs are actually spending more time, spending more visits in there than the actual deer which they were planted for. So there's a lot of things going on with pigs in Florida and how they're impacting both the agricultural industry and the environment. Um, and you're, what, what, this is basically just showing a temporal day in, a, in three species. Uh, White-tailed deer is at the front, turkey in the middle, and feral swine at the very back. And you can see there's a peak of feral swine right around 6 o'clock, just at dusk. This is winter. How many are there? Everybody asks me this. How many are there? I don't know. The U USDA, United States government, doesn't know. And actually, they just funded in 2014, they put in a line item in their federal budget to continue to fund feral swine control and research for the for the sum of $20 million a year until they figure it out, okay? 
and that's actually funding this large study in Florida, and there's a paired sister study going on in California. Is that me? I've got a few slides left, not many. Um, and what we're able to do from this is set up, uh, you see these yellow array? This is going to be a camera array. It is a camera array. Um, and what we do is we mark unique, we uniquely mark individuals and we take pictures of them. And we can then form a ratio of unmarked to marked individuals and we can monitor them. This all sounds good, but it's actually difficult to do. Um, we can also put various equipment on animals and we can understand interactions with them, each other, with livestock and at point sources like food resources. But the main thing is once we know what the density of that population is and what the population is doing, we can ask, do interactions change? Can we change how disease moves in the landscape? And what effort is needed to control hogs? And, what eff and if that effort controls a hog, how long does it take that population to rebound? And that's the big important thing. You can control hogs and control hogs and control hogs. Actually, who's done this? Controlled hogs and controlled hogs and controlled hogs. Yeah, so what effort do you need and when should you actually be doing it to get the biggest return for, for your effort? And so there's some of the things we're doing. There's, th there's actually 31 of these cameras. We trap hogs. We bait them. We built a special trailer, especially to actually hold them and do some work on them. And all this takes time. We catch them. Most hogs don't get treated this nicely. Um, and this is to the amusement of most landowners that I work on a property with. Um, so th it's very important. You can actually see there's a lot of people around this hog, but it's getting tagged, it's getting collared, it's actually having blood samples drawn from it and fecal samples taken and actual um, and venereal samples taken so it can actually look at the transported disease of this hog. It's then released. This is not a dead hog, it's a sleepy, sleeping hog. And it, it will wake up. Then those cameras that are out there are taking pictures. And you can see we're taking pictures of individually marked hogs and then unmarked hogs. And from this, we can work out densities. And so far, we've done, we've actually captured and tagged 72 feral swine in the last four months. And they've been released. And there's a lot more out there. And we get about a million pictures a month that come through this. 850,000 of them are cattle. So I'm just gonna, gonna, this is the last thing you need to know, is really from this we can do a lot of stuff. We can figure out age of breeders, how many produced, intensity of breeding, all these sorts of things. I'm gonna flick right through this. That's how much they cost. <laughs> and th it's, it's, it's probably more actually. And then if you wanna find out more, you can come and see me at the Range Cattle Research Center. Thanks. They said I'm allowed a question. <laughs> um, we bend needles. Yeah, so that we're actually, the, they're actually trapped in, they're trapped in a relatively small, small cage. It's a eight foot by four foot trap. And we use what's known as a syringe pole or a jab stick. Um, but it has a stainless steel, steel needle on it. And it, it bends. If you hit that shield, it will actually, it won't inject, it, it will bend. So. You're going for the softer parts, so you actually have to move around a little bit to the ends. Yeah. Sure. It's cookie tangle. Um, not in this manner, just because it's so um, hard to do. Um, there's, there's been a few papers written by a guy named Richard Engman if, you've, if you know Rick, Rick, who worked on Avon Park. And uh, if we're looking at just shifts and changes in sort of relative abundance, I'd recommend actually doing some of his methods because they're really cost effective. It's just they haven't been proven to actually be meaningful against a true density. And that's what this study will actually do. Um, but I think yes, and I think we have to have a monitoring program in place with a control program to really work work it well. Yeah, we're going we have to. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much.